Thank you so much for inviting me. Danke schön. I actually had two years of German in college. I got A's. However, it didn't transfer to this moment where I could give my talk in German. Okay. So I think it uh, is interesting that uh, you're so far-reaching in your vision in the environments you build here for presentations because you're thinking of the evolution where people, the speakers have eyes in back of their head. So maybe I'll position myself here so I can see my slides also. Okay. So, oh, wrong way. It's this way. There we go. So here's an overview. I want to talk about the importance of digital learning and the science of learning in higher education. And I want to give three examples that are very important today, at least in the United States, but beyond. Uh, and that's intelligent tutoring systems with agents. We have uh, MOOCs. We've already heard about MOOCs. I've picked that up in all the talks in German. Um, and then educational data mining and learning analytics. So that's on the agenda. Uh, I want to start with two incro incontrovertible claims. One is there has been an increase in interest in the science of learning during the last two decades in the United States. They've seriously put money into the science of learning. Second, digital learning environments may be essential for most of these principles of science. Um, Without the digital environments, you won't get the deep science of learning being applied. So, principles of learning are studied and money is pumped into the science of learning in virtually all organizations. You have the Institute of Education Sciences that try to create these practice guides for teachers uh, to apply the science of learning. We have the uh, APA and APS, they together had a board of scientists trying to study the science of learning where it's based on evidence, not just folklore, on uh, what helps people learn. Uh, the National Science Foundation funded six major centers on the science of learning. Uh, we had the Army Research Lab. I'm going to say a little bit more about that because a lot of the people going into the Army don't uh, understand and they basically haven't acquired the knowledge at a deep enough level. And uh, there's the National Academy of Sciences that periodically come out with these reports on how to improve learning. Now, I, since there's an interest in higher education here, I'm also going to emphasize deep learning. There are many ways to get shallow learning. But deep learning is another matter. And to get good jobs today, high paying jobs, there has to be deep learning, not just shallow learning. So here's some example of these principles. I'm not going to go through them. But we have these collections. Uh, they seem to vary from about 7 to 25 principles. And the idea is if you understood these principles and integrated them in digital environments, it would help people learn uh, much better. Uh, these are seven of the principles. Uh, uh, you can read them here. Uh, like you want to combine graphics with verbal descriptions. You want to interleave worked example solutions with problem exercises. We could go on with many of these. Uh, the ones in black, not the ones in red, they actually did a study recently. It's about ready to be re released. Uh, hot stuff by the National Council on Teacher Quality where they analyzed 48 textbooks and 48 curricula in colleges of education in the United States. And they wanted to see how much these six of these seven science principles were actually taught. And um, it was a re rather remarkable finding. They find, and you can in summary, not one textbook covers all six fundamental instructional strategies. Uh, in fact, no textbook covers more than two. 
Moreover, through their coursework, most programs prepare candidates in only a single strategy and fail to address the remaining five. Almost one-third of the programs fail to prepare candidates on even a single strategy. Shocking. In other words, the science of learning is not incorporated in the teachers uh, who are trained from the College of Education in the United States and the textbooks that they read. We recent, this was a recent report on, in August. Billions of dollars in annual teacher training is largely a waste. So they track the training and then see how much that has an impact on student learning as opposed to just folklore, what I call educational folklore, and they find it's not shown in actual learning gains. And this is kind of a crisis right now in education and uh, teacher development. So the, all this sounds a little bit shocking, um, but the good news is you can implement all six of these principles of learning in digital environments. So the computers can do it. Uh, and you need these principles to promote deeper learning. Everybody here probably knows, well aware of the difference between shallow learning, that is primarily at the lower levels of uh, Bloom's taxonomy of cognitive objectives, uh, you know, just memorization and recognition. Uh, but that's not good enough for uh, the modern 21st century. Uh, you need to have deeper learning. You need to apply your knowledge. You need to analyze things systematically. You have to make inferences. You have to be able to create. And that requires deeper learning. Uh, standard computer-based training doesn't really afford that. Uh, you need more advanced methods. Uh, you need a critical stance. Uh, you need systems thinking, causal mechanisms. Uh, that's what you need in the modern day. How to problem solve, reason, make inferences. Uh, that's what's needed. And so uh, standard uh, teaching in college and standard computer-based training uh, does not go the distance. Um, so one core illusion that a lot of instructors have is you get deep learning simply by assigning textbooks and giving well-prepared lectures. That's a common illusion, and they put a lot of effort in that. Um, let me give you an experiment uh, that challenges this. There were four conditions in a random, randomized control trial. Uh, one is uh, real human tutors, expert human tutors, who communicate with the students on physics uh, in um, computer-mediated conversation. You know, the tutor is in one room, the student in another room, and they com communicate by, by computer. The second is auto-tutor, a system I'll briefly talk about later that helps people learn applying intelligent tutoring systems principles, and it helps them learn by holding a conversation in natural language. The other condition is reading a textbook for approximately a, an equivalent amount of time. And then finally, doing nothing, okay? So, here's the results, and by the way, the results is a very discriminating test called the Force Concept Inventory that require reasoning and inferences, not just memorization. That won't go the distance. Here's the data. So one interesting point is the automated auto tutor was about the same as the human tutor. That's good news. We can automate intelligent tutorings. Uh, the other one is look at the reading the textbook was no different than doing nothing. Again, you can give shallow tests and you, they can learn, but if you have a, deep, a deeper test that requires re learning, that, that's not going to go the distance. And it's been replicated in other con domains like computer literacy and uh, critical thinking. All of them show that just putting the textbook out there and expecting them to get deep learning, that's not going to do the trick. 
So there's a certain poverty of just reading and listening to textbooks. Uh, one is most students, and there's been a meta-analysis on this, most students don't know when they read whether they're comprehending. There's only 0.27 correlation between a person's perceived comprehension and how well they actually comprehend. So they don't know. It takes more interactive mechanisms to where they have to show that they understand and uh, they need feedback. It's got to go back and forth before they can actually uh, comprehend at a deeper level. Uh, when students listen to lectures, they can't control the pace. So often they get lost. When um, you listen to lectures and it's just not at your zone of proximal development, not at the, the, the zone of what you can understand, you tend to mind wander. And so um, the normal ways people learn do, is, d doesn't have the affordances for deeper learning. So here's the conclusions. Uh, computerized learning environments are the only practical way to implement, implement principles of learning that are scientifically based and also scaffold deeper learning. Uh, the other is lectures and textbooks have affordances to provide shallow learning but not deeper learning. And finally, the US teachers are not applying these scientific principles of learning. Uh, that is not part of their professional development and the principles are too difficult for them to apply. This is where uh, you need uh, the digital tutors and let me point out three promising directions for this. Uh, one is intelligent tutoring systems with agents. The second is uh, ma MOOCs. And the third is well-coordinated educational data mining and learning analytics. So let me turn to the second part, namely intelligent tutoring systems. And here's some readings uh, for those who want to follow what I'm talking about. Um, the military was actually among the first places that uh, really found the importance of deeper learning. They were getting a lot of these high school students entering the, the military, and they had very technical tasks, and they weren't able to really handle them. If you want to find out the most recent research on intelligent tutoring system, I'd advocate you look at this uh, this uh, www.gifttutoring.org. GIFT stands for Generalized Intelligent Framework for Tutoring. And so over the last few years and into the future, we bring in about 15 experts in, a, in an area, and they write chapters, and we create a book. And we've already got three of the books already out, and you can, it's free, you know, uh, it's free, uh, you can download it and read it to your heart's content. The first one was on learner modeling, modeling what the learner knows, including not only their knowledge and cognitions, but their emotions and motivation. Uh, then it went on to instructional strategies, volume two, on to authoring tools, uh, uh, how you imagine teachers spending time creating material with authoring tools, and then that can be put out in the computer uh, for students to use. Uh, domain knowledge is the next one coming out, and after that, assessment. Next summer, we meet at Educational Testing Service on assessment, and, uh, and then we'll have a book that comes out, and then groups, team learning. So this is going to be the collection the military puts together on how to promote intelligent tutoring systems uh, in beyond high school. Uh, the Office of Naval Research had the STEM challenge. This is where they want to uh, get uh, the, the soldiers uh, to actually uh, apply and learn STEM topics, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Uh, in the United States, there is a shortage of uh, people, students who want to go into STEM topics. And so we're thankful that immigration occurs with open arms in the United States because that's where we hire most of our experts in the STEM fields. Very interesting. 
Um, so uh, here's one that they worry a lot about. Uh, this is electronics, uh, namely electronics. Their knowledge of electronics is not deep enough. So they apply these intelligent components to improve uh, the learning of electronics at a deeper level. Uh, so they, uh, these are some of the steps. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about that later. So one of the important aspects of these intelligent tutoring systems is how to assess how well it helps people learn. And one common measuring uh, metric we have is effect sizes. And uh, namely, we compare how well they learn to a classroom environment or some other suitable control. And when we talk about one sigma, that's one standard deviation in your learning environment compared to a classroom. And uh, there's been this big goal for years trying to get two sigma. Uh, that's been what we've been shooting for for years. That's two standard deviations above uh, classroom teaching. And the hope is intelligent tutoring systems can do this. So uh, if you look at the learning gains, and you can compare some, if you look at unskilled human tutors that tutor, uh, you find learning gain, uh, the, the sigma of 0.4. That's roughly, by the way, a half a letter grade. Uh, then you get intelligent tutoring systems. The, the analyses range between 0.3 and 0.4, and actually 4 sigma. That's huge. Uh, so some of them are in mathematics, like Alex and the cognitive tutor. Uh, then there's physics, Andes, and diagnoser. These are all STEM topics, as you can see. Uh, then this is digital. Uh, the Sherlock system uh, could help some of these military uh, people learn in 22 hours what a person uh, on the job would learn in four years. That's because over time on uh, normal on-the-job training, there's very few things that go wrong. But in 22 hours on an intelligent tutoring system, you can actually get them to uh, learn uh, very unusual cases and have a, a, a more concentrated spectrum of things that go wrong. Uh, then there's AutoTutor. Our effect size is about one sigma. Uh, now, a big question is skill tutors. How well do they do? But they, there is very few studies that investigate skilled tutors. It's amazing. Uh, but it's somewhere between 0.8 and 2. So that gives you a sense of how these intelligent tutoring systems compare to human tutoring. Now, one angle that I want to talk about is um, agents, these conversational agents, because they're using these more and more in these systems to help the uh, guiding the learning processes. And, uh, for example, one award-winning system was Tactical Iraqi, where Lewis Johnson had these agents in virtual environments where the human would interact with these agents with speech recognition uh, to learn the language and culture the, in Iraq. And this was done, again, inspired by the military environment. Uh, so the way to learn the language and culture is to put them in actual situations, digital situations, and to see how they'd interact. And this system attempts to understand the natural language uh, and, uh, and is effective. And it's been used by thousands of people before they go to Iraq. Here's some examples uh, of auto-tutor applications. That's the system that we built in Memphis. We have a whole group of people in our Institute for Intelligent Systems at University of Memphis building these learning environments with agents. And all of these have been funded projects that help people learn. Uh, the first system was AutoTutor uh, that helps students learn by holding a conversation in natural language. Uh, then you have Aries learning about the scientific method. Uh, you have deep tutor in physics, you have guru in biology, and we have health areas. These are on the internet. 
uh, that can be used by people uh, whenever they want. Let's see. Here, this gives you a sense of auto-tutor. If you have a uh, collision problem, uh, you have a deep question that requires reasoning, okay? And then here's you have the talking head that kind of guides you. Then you have parameters of the situation you can control. And uh, then you get to see the simulation of it to see what happens. And then you can describe what happens. And so this combination of deep reasoning questions, an agent to guide you, uh, a, a you know, control of parameters, simulation, and then description, we think the combination of that is very effective to help people learn at a deep level. Um, I don't have time to give you a description of AutoTutor and its natural language components, but it suffices to say that the goal is to get the student to do the talking and doing. Instead of uh, just lecturing, like I'm doing now, the, the, the attempt is to try to have hints and, uh, and pumps and prompts and guided questions to try to get the student to do the do and the talk, okay? And uh, so for the more knowledgeable student, all you need to do is give maybe a pump, like tell me more, or give a hint, and they'll fill in the right answer. For the less knowledgeable student, you, the tutor has to give more prompts and assertions. So notice this is very interactive. That's the point. Without the interactivity, the deep learning is not going to occur. So there can be many functions of these conversational agents. Um, one is these agents to can, can pop up and give you help when needed. But problem, most students don't ask for help when they need it. The likelihood of a student asking for help given they need help is less than 5%. So just expecting them to be self-regulated learners and optimally trying to get help, it's not there yet. Um, agents can be navigational guides. Often students don't know what to do and it can guide them. Uh, it can model good, good action, thought, and social interaction. Modeling is, of course, one very effective way of learning. It can stage arguments to prompt deeper learning. Very often, students learn deeply when there is conflict, uh, cognitive disequilibrium, different points of view, uh, and even argumentation. That's where they have to reason, and uh, that is part of deeper learning. These agents can uh, need to be adaptive. They just can't be scripted. They have to be adapt to what happens in the immediate environment. Uh, and of course, these agents can take on different roles, peers, uh, tutors, mentors, uh, the list goes on, adversaries, uh, uh, curmudgeons, you know, you can make any, any sort of agent similar to any sort of human persona. One of the uh, structures I've been very fascinated with in recent years are trialogues. This is three-party conversations uh, where the human interacting with uh, two agents, uh, typically an expert agent and a fellow student peer. And so uh, sometimes you lear learn vicariously by just observing the expert interacting with a student agent. Other times, you want to get the human to actually teach the agent. One good way of getting deep in learning is to teach it, okay? And then, uh, of course, you have the standard human tutoring. Uh, here's one sort of uh, systematic trend that we, uh, th that we try to have. Uh, if the student is low ability, we tend to have vicarious learning, or they just observe. If the, uh, their medium ability, tutorial dialogue. But if it's high ability, uh, teachable agents. Okay, so um, 
This is a snapshot of an Alex. Uh, I, I, I don't know how many of you know about the Alex Intelligent Tutoring System for math, but it teaches math anywhere from uh, basic numeracy all the way to advanced statistics. And uh, I know it's popular in Europe because it was, I, I think in, it started by somebody in Belgium that went to the United States at UC Irvine. But um, it's, it's a great intelligent tutoring system, but a lot of people, a lot of students get bored with it after a while. It, it's too hard. Um, and so what we did is had a system with these agents to combine. So you would have a tutor agent and a peer agent and a student input, and then the, uh, you get the solution. And uh, so what we try to do is get these agents to talk about the conceptual underpinnings in mathematics, not just uh, drill and kill or procedural learning, but the conceptual underpinnings. Okay, and what we found is the um, agents really improve the learning over the normal uh, sort of way uh, that students learn. It turns out, and, and by the way, this last study was on college students. What we're finding is more and more students are entering college that don't have basic numeracy, skill, numeracy skills. And the universities don't know what to do with them. One way is to assign them an intelligent tutoring system uh, to improve their knowledge. Similarly, what we find is a lot of the college students come in and they don't read well enough. Some reason is they're immigrants. Another reason is they just never were motivated to read. Um, and, and, and in fact, in a recent study, a third of the students do not read at the eighth grade level in college. And so one way to remediate this is to assign them uh, an intelligent tutoring system, and we've been developing an intelligent tutoring systems using these agents. It turns out that um, there's 50 to 70 million adults in the United States who don't read at a level for them to get a decent job. And uh, so uh, just as there's a problem in low comprehension skills and reading of the adult literacy, uh, adult literacy in the adult population, similarly, that's affecting college now. So you have these agents uh, try to have these visuals and then ask them these questions and you have a tutor agent and then a student agent and, um, and that's how they learn. Sometimes you set up game competitions between them. That's very motivating. You um, also have these systems, and by the way, all these systems are on the web, on the internet. Uh, they're all available. Uh, it's not like you have to have a desktop version for these. Uh, in one game that we recently commercialized with Pearson Education, we tried to get scientific reasoning. Because as you know, a lot of the public uh, doesn't have deep scientific reasoning. They confuse correlation with um, uh, causation. That's very common. And uh, so the, the attempt is to come up with a game, a serious game, to help them have scientific learning. And this sort of game was about aliens that came down to Earth that tried to propagate bad science. And so you were, the student was trying to discover uh, who these charlatans were. Uh, sometimes these charlatans came through the news, sometimes uh, reported studies, and so the human was trying to figure out uh, which of the studies were prop propagating bad science. And so um, we have these game contexts with aliens and also uh, trialogues with a tutor. Um, the interesting part of this is um, trying to build a game that applies learning principles and game principles is very, 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 very hard. We, you know, this generation of digital natives that are now in college, uh, they like to play games. 
and they spend many hours at it. You know, the typical st statistic in the United States that they're spending like six hours on games and social media and maybe five minutes on homework. <laughs> uh, you know, the divide between informal learning and formal learning is very, uh, very critical. Um, so what you tr we try to do is uh, try to combine these, but I, I have to say that if you have deep learning and difficult material, that is in some sense incompatible with uh, fun. And trying to wire the two together, <laughs> many people have tried, but they haven't done it. Uh, why can't you get them spending six hours a day trying to learn about anatomy and uh, expl exploration of why somebody is having a particular disease, uh, you know, spending six hours? That hasn't been accomplished yet. Maybe you can solve it in Germany. Yep. So, uh, conclusions about assessments with agents. Shallow knowledge is acquired through didactic training. Deep knowledge through you have to have more case-based explanations. Uh, and, uh, well, this is something I'm not going to dwell on. I, so let me mention that um, trialogues now are coming to assessment. Uh, and so you can, you can put these students in virtual worlds. And uh, I'll show this in a little bit. Uh, so if the student is low ability, then they have short responses, inaccurate or irrelevant information, little initiative, and violation of social norms. So you can um, actually assess students. And this is currently be being done and worked on at Educational Testing Service, where they put the human in virtual reality environments and with agents. And in this virtual reality environment, the human should be uh, able to read what happens in that environment. If you read this, it says don't bring liquid or food into the library. Uh, and of course, you have your doofus agent that does a lot of things wrong. And this doofus agent will actually walk into the library with a bottle of water. That means they haven't read uh, they haven't read the Stein, and the question is whether the human tries to stop them having a conversation with this agent and the smarty pants agent. So you have two agents, and the human wanders through the virtual reality with these agents, communicating with them, acting with them, and from that you infer their, their speaking, listening, reading, and writing skills. So the idea for assessing these skills, particularly for English language learners, is uh, whether you can, they can go and actually journey through a virtual world, interact with these agents, and demonstrate whether they can, uh, under, whether they can read, write, speak, and listen. And right now, the hope is in a, in a 45 minute period of time they get all these skills. That's a far cry from the normal, uh, you know, pencil and paper sort of multiple choice questions. So ETS is definitely going through a different realm. Here's for assessment of science, inquiry-based science. Again, they're going to be having these agents in virtual worlds to assess them. Even PISA uh, is turning to agents. That's the um, P PISA, of course, is the program for international student assessment, where 1,500 people, students who are 15 year olds from each country, take these tests of numeracy, literacy, uh, science, and now they're doing collaborative problem solving. And the way they're setting up these problems in uh, for collaborative problem solving that's being assessed this year is with agents. So instead of maybe three or four people in a group collaboratively doing problem solving, the, the logistics were too difficult for that. So instead they have the human interacting with two or three other agents and, uh, and 
by virtue of their interaction, they can assess their collaborative problem-solving skills. I, um, I was fortunate enough to be a chair of the um, framework and assessment committee for OECD, uh, and this is the, uh, the complex sort of pro collaborative problem-solving uh, framework where you have the problem solving uh, along the columns, these stages, and then you have the collaboration along the, the, well, no, it's the rows that is the problem solving, and the columns are collaboration. And fr what you do is set up these problems to collaboratively problem solve and assess their capacity uh, with all these cells. Okay, let me turn to uh, the third topic, and each of these are going to be shorter uh, in respect for the time. Um, and it's MOOCs, and these are some readings of MOOCs. Uh, George Siemens and I, uh, and Dragon Gasific and I collaborate on research on MOOCs. George Siemens, who some people believe was the beginning person who created MOOCs, he just uh, met with me last week, and I'm sharing some of the slides that he has. He gave a similar talk at, like this in Sweden in June. And so, um, so you uh, know MOOCs are a disruptive technology and a lot of discussion in higher education about it. Uh, this is where you can have these, these courses online. And you also have social media with it. So you can have chat interaction with peers. Uh, you can also have tweets. You can create uh, blogs. Um, uh, so imagine any time, at any point, people can take courses with MOOCs. Uh, Stanford has a course in computational linguistics that 30,000 students took at various universities throughout the United States. There's been another MOOC on data mining with 30,000. I think that was out of Coursera. Um, and so uh, when there's precious knowledge, cutting edge knowledge, that not too many people know about, then MOOCs are a very effective way to go. You can share that uh, throughout all the universities uh, at low cost. Uh, for example, in computational linguistics, there's only, there were only about five institutions with professors that could teach, and you know, they had excellence in computational linguistics, like Stanford, University of Penn. Uh, so they made a MOOC, so it could be shared throughout the United States. It's not like every university has their professional computational linguist. Similarly, for data mining, uh, uh, only a small number of institutions had that uh, competency, and you can create MOOCs and distribute it, and students can have it all over. You can imagine uh, uh, one future for education is that the professors get the students plugged into MOOCs uh, to, um, as part of their courses. Um, so there's been a gro growth in MOOCs. You've probably all seen similar trends as this. And, um, they're all over the United States and all over Europe and also Asia and also Australia. Uh, if you look at the timeline, and uh, this, is, um, this is back in the Stone Ages of uh, MOOCs towards the left, and then uh, you had connectivism of George Siemens, and um, right around 2008, now, you have the Stanford MOOCs and the Harvard MOOCs, MIT MOOCs, uh, Audacity, uh, edX, and Coursera, uh, and, and so it's growing. Most MOOCs now are actually used by industry. Uh, industry especially uses Coursera for um, certification on various skills, whereas edX, uh, that that came out of Harvard and Stanford, that, uh, that it, it, it is used a lot by universities. Uh, so it's hitting the universities. Um, 
And whether it's the massive online culture, all these news items, the MIT news when they said all their courses are supposed to be open. Uh, Arizona State now is the largest university in the United States in terms of enrollment, and they have a tight connection with the MOOC culture. Uh, so it's definitely uh, there and there to stay. If you look at uh, growth in U.S. education, if you look back in 2002, only about 10% of the courses were uh, distance courses. Now it's more like a third. So in the course of, in this case, about a decade, the higher percentage of the students taking courses is more uh, uh, distant and online. And so that's the trend. And MOOCs can be providing high quality uh, sort of education. I recently visited University of Michigan and they have kind of a ma MOOC mass production plant <laughs> where a professor walks in and for $200,000 they go through this very elaborate systematic process to get that course on a MOOC and uh, once it's on a MOOC, it can be used all over the place. And it, truthfully, the systematic way of creating the MOOC at University of Michigan was far superior than what a, any professor does in creating a course. And if you slip in there the science of learning to, to guide the creation of these MOOCs, you actually are creating a product that is, is better than what's going on now. Um, these, notice the widespread distribution of topics with these MOOCs, okay? It's not just one area. These are the major MOOC distributors, Coursera, which once again uh, businesses tend to use, and edX, okay? But you have Udacity and the others take a smaller piece of the pie. So it's a whole, it's a distributed market, but dominated by edX for college especially, and Coursera for corporations. So uh, th th this just summarizes that MOOCs are out there, and, um, and a lot of universities are debating how to use them. I've, I've often thought that there could be a nice sort of economic way where, um, uh, MOOC creators, could they need to get paid for it, right? Um, and I know in Germany where edu higher education is free, that may be uh, a difficult economic uh, process. <laughs> However, in the United States with tuition and fees going way up, then if the university got a cut and the MOOC creators got a cut, you have a nice market. So let me turn to the last topic. Um, uh, educational data mining, this will be even shorter, uh, you got a lot of data out there, right? Uh, my gosh, every 60 seconds, 98,000 tweets, uh, all these Facebook updates, 7 million instant messages, uh, you, you know, you can draw whatever conclusion on volume you want. That's a lot of data out there, a lot of big data. and. Uh, that requires more cloud computing. So it's going to be in the cloud, and where, that, where it is exactly is a big question. Uh, I, I, I often wonder where in the cloud my systems are, uh, and it's very nebulous. Um, so there's got to be a way of maintaining it, but in a safe way for higher education. It's got to be protected. It's got to be backed up. It's got to be, uh, you know, uh, there's all sorts of legal uh, issues that come into place on uh, where the data is stored. Um, one exciting project that I've, I've seen is, and this is just an example, is where you have human tutors right now in tutor.com that while a student is learning on the computer, while they're learning, they um, get stuck. 
at times. They press a button and they can get contact to a t human tutor uh, through chat. And, uh, and it turns out that there's 3,500 tutors, human tutors, ready to go to have an interaction with them. And so, uh, what we've been doing is looking at those interactions and we're now trying to automate it. So instead of having the 3,500 tutors, it, you might have 300. So the computer tutor, uh, and through data mining, uh, you can pick up these patterns. The computer tutor uh, can answer many of the students' uh, needs. However, when that fails, they go to a human tutor. And so right now, we're in the process of trying to automate that, but that takes a lot of data mining and data analytics on all of these tutoring protocols, and, and there's a lot of them. Uh, we, this group painstakingly annotated a quarter of a million uh, tutoring sessions. That's a lot of work, but they needed to do it in order to use data mining procedures to automate it. And so, um, you know, it's big data. So let me end with just uh, my, my vision on uh, higher education in the future is the EPEL ver uh, one on the electronic personal advisor for learning. If you just let students do it by themselves, they might not do the sensible things. But if you have an advisor, an EPEL, then uh, that is guided by the principles of science of learning, then you have some hope on making some good progress for deeper learning. So you have these agents as tutor and mentors applying AI, artificial intelligence, and, uh, and then you get a pr learner profile. Uh, all their characteristics, both cognition, emotion, and demographics, and personality. And then you have a large inventory of courseware and the best sort of learning resources available. And then you have intelligent action selection. So you can assign and recommend the best sort of next thing to be studying uh, for that personal student. Um, and, um, and that is at all levels of grain size, not just the next problem, but you can give hints and uh, scaffolded guidance uh, in this way. But, um, you know, there are issues to be solved. For example, uh, control between the learner and the institution. So who's in control of this? Uh, ownership, who owns the data? Uh, integration, how are you going to integrate this? How can you integrate the student's profile from high school to college? and college to the workforce. That's a big problem because especially when you, data needs to be protected, uh, I don't know how that problem is gonna be solved. Wouldn't it be nice in one respect where you can track a person's knowledge throughout their lifetime? However, um, you know, people wanna protect their data and uh, they want personalization to be just within themselves. So that's a problem. I don't know how it's gonna be solved. And, um, and, of course, there's the structure of whether to have centralized or decentralized teaching. So, we have the technology, we have the science of learning, we have uh, an enormous possibility to promote deep learning uh, at this point in history. And I think uh, most of the challenges lie in uh, how to implement it. Uh, as a society. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Gresso. You stay with me for a okay. minute. We have just a little time for two or three questions. I imagine that there are a lot of questions that you have. We only have like five minutes time left, so I, I see you. Yeah, you just I'm, I, I don't think there is a microphone here, so I'll just come over to you. Mm -hmm. and maybe you give us your name and your institution and then your question. Thank you. 
you very much. Well, my name is Jürgen Handke, and incidentally, I come from the area of computational linguistics. Ah, and great. we experimented with intelligent tutoring systems in the 1980s. We were very dissatisfied mm -hmm. with the performance. We did it on the basis of uh, orthographical input. Mm -hmm. Now today, we're still experimenting with them. Mm -hmm. And let me be provocative. The most important function is the switch off button. Mm -hmm. because, mm -hmm. because the language processing capacity of intelligent, so-called intelligent tutors is below the level of intelligence. And mm -hmm. we cannot let these intelligent tutors interact with our students. So we decided to use videos, a sort of anticipatory system of videos instead. Mm -hmm. So the provocative thing is they don't work at the moment. Uh, aha, well, we have evidence to the contrary. One of the uh, challenges in the 1980s is a lot of the intelligence was brittle. It was, uh, if you look at natural language, uh, once things like latent semantic analysis happened in higher dimensional spaces, you could analyze uh, the language, uh, uh, the meaning of the language much better. So uh, read our papers and read some of the other papers, uh, at least that's going on in the United States, and don't give up hope. Yeah. <laughs> All right, don't give up hope. Yeah. Uh, I hope for another one or two questions. Mm -hmm. All right. Hello, my name is Malte Persicke, and um, I, I, I'm doing a statistics course um, for my students. And we, um, a couple of years ago, implemented a MOOC with, with quizzes, with interactive software examples, all stuff like that, tutors. And, and, and what we see is um, that we don't get one sigma, we don't get two sigma, but we get zero sigma. Mm -hmm. The students just didn't get better. And then we looked at the grade distribution and the performance distribution before the, 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 the MOOC, and there wasn't enough space to even go to 0.5 sigma, because the students were already quite good in, in what they were doing. So isn't one of the main focuses that we should lay on the whole MOOC and, and electronic learning thing to identify the areas where there is need and demand for such uh, systems that you described which can actually improve learning because the good teachers are good enough that they achieve good grades and they are able uh, to communicate their stuff uh, correctly and with high learning outcomes. So isn't, isn't it a focus to, to identify those teachers who are uh, below what could be achieved? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, you've pointed out two or three very gems of wisdom. One is aptitude, treatment, interaction. And it is true uh, that if the student is exceptionally good, <laughs> the teacher doesn't need to do much at all. Uh, you, you know. It's often the people who are struggling where these systems help and uh, help the most. We always look at two types of aptitude treatment interactions. One that tries to get the struggling student up to normal, uh, whatever normal is. Um, the other is where the rich get richer. That good students, really they get exceptional when they uh, uh, are engaged in certain learning environments, whereas the lower spectrum, it's too hard for them to even get started. So we're only at the infancy in looking at these aptitude treatment interactions, the precise conditions in which these different, different type of systems work. Uh, very much so. Mm -hmm. All right, one last question. Mm -hmm. I think you were first, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. I'll keep that for you. As you had, okay, alles klar. Um, hi, Professor Grasser. Thanks for the excellent uh, talk. Mm -hmm. So much information in there. I'll ask you for the presentation. Mm -hmm. uh, my name is Stefan Wisbauer, a company called Lecturio here in Germany. We do online learning. My question is this. You remarked on the cost situation in Germany. You know, people are used to having things for free. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the benefits is obviously it does widen the access. Mm -hmm. and, uh, one of the things that strikes me about online learning is you were often discussing within a sort of scope of people that are already training in certain ways, and one thing that it can obviously do is 
busted wide open uh, in the sense that a lot more people, all sorts of ages, can mm -hmm. learn, you know, without the pre-qualifications we require of them to go to university, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm just wondering, you know, in your research or in your outlook as you occupy yourself a lot with this, that subject, you know, how do you see that potentially transforming things in five to ten years? Aha, uh -huh. aha. Uh -huh. um, excellent question. All of these have been excellent questions. Um, I think uh, some people have said there might be certification in higher education, where you're certified in all these topics rather than having degree, you, you know, degree programs. So you look at your resume and it's got all these certifications. That's been one recommendation. Cert cert certificates haven't really taken off in higher education yet in the States. Uh, they try them, but that's a little bit slow. Um, so, in, for the low ability people, the struggling people who don't have numeracy or basic uh, reading skills, it would be good to have it free and in the United States, some of us are advocating on having internet be free like it is in South Korea, free to everybody. And on that information freeway to have free basic courses that they can take, free portals that anybody can go to. Uh, at any, even better readers they can go to because they can be useful for teacher education. Um, the uh, free on the information highway that any of them can use, but that's got to be funded by the federal government. Uh, but roads are funded by the government. Uh, radio is free. Uh, education is supposed to be free. So I think certain things have to be free. And then other things I think people have to pay for more precious sort of knowledge and things like that. Uh, but how Germany at the free education is going to um, integrate it with these MOOCs in a cost-effective way, I, uh, uh, that's a very good question that I don't have an answer to yet. <laughs> yep. And that's a question that we might also discuss this yeah. afternoon later yeah. on. Mm -hmm. I wish we had more time for more questions, Professor mm -hmm. Grasser. Actually, we're just running out of time. Sure. But you will stay here for, for oh. lunch in the afternoon, so oh, there will yeah. be uh, opportunity for whoever wants to ask questions, come up to you directly, personally, yep. on a personal level, yep. so to mm -hmm. speak. Mm -hmm. And so thank you very much, Professor mm -hmm. Gresso, for your very informative talk. Okay. And yeah, good to have you here. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.